for today it's uh, i'm very happy to introduce professor oliver ramari and he's going to tell us about variations around the brune titchmarsh inequality oh. okay so um, hello everyone uh, it's very sad not not to see people but that's life um, i'm very happy to be uh, at this conference I would, of course, prefer to be in Chennai, and uh, if all goes well, I'll be there in November, I hope, so we'll be able to have some coffee. Okay, uh, today I decided to go through a very, very early result of Balu, uh, 1976, very uh, long time ago, and uh, um, I decided to show you this result because, um, because it's very flexible. And so it may, the method may be used most probably in many uh, uh, different circumstances. And uh, also I'll, I'll go slowly. Okay. So the, 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 what we're looking at is this CRM, which can be extracted from the CRM of uh, Balu and Ramachama. Um, take the sum of on primes, P for me it's a prime. And little p is a prime, and capital P is a bound for this prime. And um, take a parameter gamma, uh, say gamma is the square root of p, something like that. And look at one plus cos gamma log p, uh, that's a non-negative function, times log p. And the result of uh, Balu and Ramachama is that you can give a good size lower bound for this quantity. Of course, you expect this quantity to be of size constant times p, and uh, you don't get the proper constants. 0 0.0089 is most probably smaller than what it should be. But still, it is positive. Um, um, OK, if, if you want to understand a bit what happens, just replace uh, um, log p by log n, take uh, an integer n. And the der derivative of uh, gamma log p or log n is gamma by p. So essentially, the, the derivative uh, is gamma by capital P, say gamma is square root P, so it's one upon square root capital P. So when N goes from N to N plus one, uh, your integer, I mean, the quantity gamma log N moves slowly around the circle from N to N plus one to N plus two and so on. And after um, P pi gamma, uh, N plus one plus, plus P pi gamma, you've uh, completed the full turn of the circle. And you don't know exactly where you uh, I think you went mute. Uh, Professor Ramari, you went mute. Could you please unmute? Uh, sorry, we cannot hear you. Could you please unmute yourself? Yes, I yes now, now it's better. Now it's better. I think you muted me. Oh, <laughs> oh sorry. Oh, 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 sorry, sir. No, no, no. No big deal. At least it gives a feeling of having someone. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so after, after P goes, I mean, the integer N, let's say, goes in an interval of size P by gamma, you end up on the other side of the circle and you don't know exactly where you are. So you have to work on this in small interval uh, of size p by gamma. And uh, when you have integers, you can do things. But when you have primes, you may have gaps for these primes. And you don't know exactly where is the next prime. Uh, if, if you have some idea about the distribution of primes, um, to, to answer this question, you would need to be able to localize your prime in an interval of size square root p around p. And that's something that we cannot do even on Rivana hypothesis. But still, we can, uh, we can prove that. The second thing that you may say, uh, OK, since analytical means are not going to work, maybe you can use a, a bilinear form techniques, no binogradov you know, stuff. But that's not going to work, because uh, uh, cos gamma p is essentially exponential i gamma p. So it's uh, i gamma log p. So it's essentially p to the i gamma, and it's multiplicative in p. So uh, binary sums are not going to work. Okay. So, uh, but I'll show you how how easy it is to prove this one. 
Uh, what can we do with that? Here is a theorem that uh, we can prove from it. And uh, then I'm going to use this theorem. Uh, so the theorem is that if you take uh, zeta prime upon zeta minus zeta prime upon zeta, for people who don't understand that it's a conference about analytic number theory, I recall that zeta of s is one upon n to the s for uh, real part of s strictly larger than one. So zeta has a simple pole in one, the residue is one, and minus zeta prime upon zeta is essentially one upon uh, s minus one, when uh, sigma is close to one. It can be made into uh, exact inequality that has been made in a nice manner by Delange in 87, with even some improved inequality. And, um, <coughs> okay. <coughs> For, for the Riemann zeta function, we are very interested in its zeros. And at the beginning, let us have a look at the zeros next to the line real part equal to one. And even for simplicity, at the line uh, real part of S equal to one. So assume you have a zero in one plus i gamma. And what you have is that next to this zero minus zeta prime upon zeta, say in sigma plus i gamma when sigma is close to one. Well, it behaves like minus one upon sigma minus one, plus a, a constant term. Um, yes, it's, it's simply the, the effect of analyticity. Uh, uh, it's not minus one, sorry, because this zero could have multiplicity. So it's minus m when m is the multiplicity, but let, let's say it's a simple zero, so it's minus one. And uh, the theorem I have uh, here, which is a consequence of the previous one, gives me an inequality, gives me that minus zeta prime upon zeta and sigma, uh, plus a real part of minus zeta prime upon zeta and sigma plus i gamma is larger than something. Uh, that's positivity, it's larger than something. If I have a zero in one plus i gamma, the left-hand side is bounded when sigma goes to one, the right-hand side blows away. And um, so it means that you cannot have a, a, a zero in uh, I plus I gamma, a multiple zero would be, uh, would be, would be the same. Um, if, if, even if you want to, to have a quantification, I mean, not a zero in one, but in zero close to one, it's easy to see with a factor gamma to the two sigma minus one, uh, that is going to give you a zero free region of size one minus constant upon, upon gamma. So it's exactly what, so what, what we want. Uh, what is rather amazing with this way of proving the zero free region is that you don't look at sigma plus two i gamma. You just look at what happens in sigma and in sigma plus i gamma, that's all. Okay, so now I have to prove uh, theorem R, but first I have to prove theorem B from theorem A. And that's very easy, really. Um, I do it for, for younger people. Uh, minus zeta prime upon zeta, it can be expanding into the Hirschel series. It's sum of lambda n by n. Lambda n is a von Mongol function. It's a non-negative function. And essentially, it's log p when n is a prime. And then you have a, um, the Hirschel series uh, differs from sum of log p by p to the s by only an analytical and bounded function. But in fact, since lambda of n is non-negative, you can, you can even keep it. Uh, so when you look at the, the quantity we want to, to consider, which is minus zeta prime upon zeta plus real part of minus zeta prime upon zeta on sigma plus i gamma. Well, look at what you get. Uh, uh, what happens is that the real part of one upon p to z s or one upon p to the sigma plus i gamma gives you this cos gamma log p. So the coefficient you get on top here is one plus cos gamma log p which is non-negative. The consequence of non-negative is that you can throw away the terms that you don't know how to control. So you can limit your summation for p larger than t squared. And then you use the decomposition. You have a lower bound for this part and you get the theorem that I stated. So once you have theorem A, uh, getting a zero field region is real easy. So if I'm not mistaken, I'm going to prove theorem A now. Uh, first, I have to, to say somewhat why it would be difficult. 
So the first thing I have to, to do is to recall the prime number theorem in case someone around did not know it. Uh, in fact, in this proof, we don't need the prime number theorem. What we need is that the, a lower bound for the number of primes. We would need that the number of primes less to x or less to capital P, but less to x, uh, is larger than a constant x upon log x. It's equivalent to say that the number of, uh, so sum of log P for P less than x and P a prime is, is larger than constant times x. But we know that it's equivalent to x. Uh, so if we look at the, at the, at the problem, uh, one plus gamma log n behaves in interval like uh, size p upon gamma like this bottom stuff. And um, at the bottom here, uh, you can have some uh, constant times p upon gamma integers. When you sum upon all the interval, you can get a, a positive proportion of the integers that are close to these bottoms. And of course, the, the primes are not uh, positive densities and of density one upon uh, log p. Uh, so maybe they could all be in these bottoms. The information you have uh, is that this uh, bad interval, these bad places are intervals. And that's what we're going to, to, to use. Uh, to use that, I have to recall the Brundtich March inequality, but I'm going too fast. I have to go slower. Well, Yes. Um, so the Brundtich March inequality, it, it has two parameters, and I'll, I'll tell you about the, the two of them. So you take a, a prime in an interval, say between y and y plus x, and you further assume that it is congruent to something in an arithmetic progression. And uh, by using the sieve, uh, uh, Brun was able to prove, uh, I mean, at the beginning, Brun was able to prove, but now everyone is able to prove, that uh, we can give an upper bound for this number. So the upper bound is x upon phi of q divided by log x. That's what you expect to be. You expect this quantity to be x upon phi of q divided by, let's say, log x, for simplicity. Um, and what you lose uh, is this factor 2 on top, you see. Is, uh, which I've put in green. Huh? And the denominator is log x by q. Uh, in fact, around y, it should be log y. And you have log x by q. So for instance, if you take q equal to 1, which is what I'm going to do uh, soon, huh? and you look at the number of primes in the interval y and y plus y to the one third, uh, an interval of length y to the one third around y, huh? well, the probability to be a prime around y is one upon log y. The interval is of size y to the one third. So what you expect, it's y to the one third divided by log y. And what you get with the Brundtich March inequality is that it is less than six y to the one third upon log y. So you lose a constant, um, which, which is really the, the, the discovery of, uh, of um, Brun. So it is called the brun teach march inequality because of Linux 1961, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, because teach march used that in the teach march divisor problem by, and used the method of Brun to get it. So Linux decided to call it the brun teach march theorem. And, and since then, it stuck. Uh, though, in fact, the theorem that I've stated now is due to Montgomery and Brun. But that's how things are made. OK, so uh, let us go back to our problem. You see, we have our interval uh, from p to 2p, and we have all this repetition of uh, behavior. So um, uh, essentially, a, a, a proper interval is not exactly uh, a shift of an interval, but it's a multiplicative shift. So you have to look at what happens between uh, p naught, uh, some p, and lambda times p, where lambda is essentially Gamma is very large, so exponential 2 pi upon gamma is essentially uh, it's essentially 2 pi upon gamma. Uh, it's a very small number. So you look between p and 1 plus something small times p. And uh, you, you get this behavior, and you have this bad interval at the bottom here. 
So uh, I've given some names, P0, P1, P2, P, PJ for the, for the bad points. And you look at some, let's say, multiplicative interval around it, say between beta minus one and beta, where beta put some numerics is something very small, exponential 0 0.03 divided by gamma. But it's still of, um, of positive proportion. So when P is out of this interval, <clears throat> then gamma log P is out of this collection of intervals. So you see they are centered about um, odd multiples of pi. Uh, so where, where uh, cos, um, cos x is equal to minus one. And you're aware by a small quantity, which is this one. So when P does not belong to this union of interval, cos gamma log P is strictly larger than minus one. You don't save much, but you save something. I mean, you, you, you can improve the numeric, just that I want it to be, uh, to be clear. Uh, once you, you have that, now you have to show that uh, all the primes are not in this union of interval. And for that, uh, you have the Brundtich marsh inequality. So look at the length of the interval. Get that essentially it's P by gamma times a small constant. And this constant can be as small as you want if you diminish this 0 0.03, which is where the size of the interval. Get the number of primes that you can have at most in this interval with the Brundtich marsh inequality here. Uh, get an idea of the number of interval, multiply all of that, and you get that the total number of primes is essentially P upon log P times something which is a small constant, and this constant can be less than the number of primes. So it means that you have uh, a positive proportion of the primes that are outside of this interval, and that gives you theorem A. So you see it's a, it's a, it's a simple consequence of the non-accumulation of primes in interval. Um, what is surprising in this proof is that you don't use integers. Uh, earlier proof of the geography um, region starts from integer. Here, the integer going from the primes to the integer, or from the integer to the primes, is included in the C. Um, but for the argument of the zero field region, you, you work uh, with primes directly. And um, that, that's a very flexible uh, method. OK, so what can you do? Um, you see the, the Brunswick marsh inequality, it has two aspects. You have the size, uh, P in an interval, yes. And you have P congruent to A module Q. So can you mimic this interval in the Q aspect? Uh, in fact, in the paper by uh, Ramachandra and uh, Balasubramanian a long time ago, the Q aspect was also used, but in a, in a, in, in a very different manner. Um, because when you have a new proof of a zero field region, you wonder whether you can prove that there's no z equals zero, and, or whether you can improve on the, the, the dependence in the parameters. It turns out that they get exactly the same kind of zero free region that uh, we get uh, usually. Um, OK, so uh, but we, we can use uh, the, the same process in Q aspect in a in different manner. So the idea is to say that the primes do not accumulate. Uh, what was what we used in now was that the primes do not accumulate in some interval, and now we want to use the fact that the, the primes do not accumulate in residue classes, and that's a straightforward application of uh, of um, wanted math. Uh, if you take a, give yourself a modulus Q and you look at what happens in Z by Q Z. Um, well, the number of invertible residue classes or reduced residue classes that are covered by the primes less than x, uh, the number of classes uh, is a positive proportion of phi of q. So uh, it's larger than log x by q upon 2 log x. So if you take uh, x equal to q square, you get that the number of primes that are the number of classes that are covered are at least phi of q by 4. Uh, and that's absolutely trivial to prove. Um, we have very good explicit bound for the number of primes up to x, and uh, the Brundtich marsh inequality of, um, of Montgomery and Boone does, uh, does the rest. So, um, how, how can one use this, uh, this um, 
Well, first, uh, I'm, I'm, later I'll tell you about how one can use this information. But first, I have to, to go through another paper of um, Amachandra uh, about the factor two. Uh, you know, in the Brunchich March, you have the upper bound was less than two x times divided by five q log x by q. And I want to show you a very simple proof that this two, uh, I mean, if you break this factor two, then you get a, a wonderful result. Um, the, the proof is just in this space. So you see, it's, it's very simple. Just assume that uh, for, for given modulus Q and for any class A, uh, reduced class, uh, the number of primes congruent to A modulus Q and between X and two X, that's for simplicity, is less than two minus delta for some positive delta x upon phi of q log x. So I've cheated a bit. It's not log x by q, I put log x. So you need to beat this uh, log x by q and this two. So, so you have that. Then if you give, uh, if you take any uh, quadratic character, L1 k is larger than one upon log q. So it's really a very, very strong uh, consequence. And, and the proof is, is here. Let me see if I have it. Yeah, I have that. So it, just look at zeta times LSK, you know, that's not very original, everyone does that. The sum of A of N upon N to the S, and A of N is a, a real number which is non-negative. Uh, for the square, A of N squared is larger than one, but what's, that's what is usually used to, to get a lower, lower bound for L1K. So if we use our hypothesis and we look at the, at the quantity, uh, sum of k of p for p between x and 2x. Well, k of p is either one, is a uh, yeah, either one is a minus one. Let me forget about the, the prime that divides q. So it's either one, is a minus one. Uh, so this quantity is the total number of primes minus twice the value for. Um, for uh, the primes when k of p equals minus one. And the number of primes for k of p equals minus one, you have an upper bound here. So since you need a lower bound and you have a minus, that's exactly what you have. And it gives you uh, phi of q by two, that's the number of, of, uh, in, of classes A where k of p is equal to minus one. Get your, your, put your upper bound inside and what you get is delta minus one x upon log x. So instead of minus x upon log x, which would mean that most of the primes have k of p equal to minus one, you save a bit of something. You save delta. And then it's rather easy. From this k of p, you can get to a of n by n. So look at this smooth part. So a of n by n, e n by x minus e n by x. By positivity, you can reduce to the place that you like between x and 2x. Uh, then you can approximate exponential and give you, uh, you n by x. So the n disappears and one by x appears. A n, uh, you can say, I don't know much about A n, but I can look at A p. And A p, it's one plus k of p. And because of the, the previous uh, inequality, you get that it's larger than delta upon log x. So you have a lower bound for that. Then you use Molin transform. Uh, because of your kernel exponential, you get a gamma factor, which is makes things converge uh, extremely fast. And you discover that this quantity, A of n by n, e n upon 2x minus e n x, is essentially L1 chi. Um, compare uh, this part with the lower bound, get L1 chi larger than 1 upon log. So you see this factor 2 is, is not to be taken lightly. Um, if you, if you break it, I mean, if you improve on it, uh, um, you're going to get a wonderful result. So uh, if you want to use the Bruntich March, it's better not that you expect uh, to be able to do better than. Okay. Um, what about the factor two? So that was the, the factor two uh, in the Q aspect. But what can, can you say about it in the X aspect? Um, there's a talk later by um, um, Andrew Granville about some work with Alissa Lumle, and I think that he'll tell you much more than I will on this problem. Um, so 
Is, is, is this factor two necessary in the X aspect if you forget about the, the Q aspect? Uh, to, to have an idea of that, you can look at the spacings between the primes. Give yourself an interval between Y and Y plus X and look at all the primes you can put inside. So P1, P2, P3, till P kappa, say. And um, it, it's good to look at the spacings. So uh, uh, H2 is between, uh, it's P2 minus P1, H3 is P3 minus P1. So you get P1 plus a set of spacings, H1, H2, H3, H kappa. And, and these spacings are, should be spacings of primes, you see. Uh, you cannot have a, a P to be a prime, P plus two to be a prime, and P plus four to be a prime, because one of these three is going to be divisible by three. So you have some conditions on these spacings to be, uh, to be, uh, post, to be uh, spacings of primes. That's what we call admissible condition. Uh, admissibility is that essentially you do, you do not cover everything. You still have one class uh, where you can escape, just like uh, the primes never cover the class zero. And um, so the way to look at the, the factor two problem is uh, um, uh, look at the length of your, of your kappa tuple, which is uh, the space taken by, by the smallest and the largest. And uh, um, you want uh, either to get as many primes as you can in this interval, or once you have uh, kappa, the number of primes given, to find the smallest interval that contains them. Uh, we don't have much information on, on that. Uh, the, the basic result on this, uh, on this question is due to Hensley and Richards. And I think uh, uh, Andrew is going to say something better than that. Um, which we are able to get more than the, no the number of primes. So it means that uh, uh, we have an upper bound which is twice L upon log L. And we are able to find maybe places where you can have L upon log L plus something bigger than that. But it's a little low of L upon log L. And the construction of Hensley and Richard essentially it takes the primes between minus L by two and L by two. Uh, they are of density one upon log L by two, which is strictly larger than one upon L. And by playing with this uh, discrepancy between one upon L and one upon L by two, they get this improved uh, log two here. So that is the only result we have uh, uh, now uh, to improve uh, on kappa. I've read another one, but I forgot, so I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, now, numerically, what can you do? Um, because maybe you, you, can, you can get an idea that numerically it's easy to get an interval where uh, the number of primes in an interval of length L is close to 2L upon, uh, upon log L, or twice pi of L, the total number of primes. Uh, there was a website by Engelsma. Uh, this website has disappeared. Um, I don't know when it disappeared, uh, last year or a year before, uh, in which uh, he says that he has computed, he has found an admissible tuple of this many number that was covering this length. And, but I, I, I don't have the tuple in, uh, with me because uh, the website has disappeared and I didn't copy it. So it means that instead of the constant one, I mean, the number of primes is L upon log L, uh, we can show, find a place where we have 1.034 primes, if you believe the prime compatible conjecture, of course. But at least it's larger than one, but you see it's extremely small, I mean, what we are able to prove is two. I mean, the number of primes in this interval is less than two, twice pi of L. And what we are able to prove numerically, I mean, to, to get examples, not to prove, but to get uh, um, intuition that we, we can prove is 1.034. Um, so the, the problem is, of course, can you improve on that? Um, and, and, and what is the real limsup is, do we have a, a, a limitation of two like we have with uh, the zero uh, and why? 
Okay, uh, I stop about uh, this part. And um, so we, we are somehow stuck with this, with this factor two, but uh, we can have a look at the uh, large shield extension. Let me have a look at the time because I don't see people. Yes. Um, we can do things on average upon the, the moduli. So uh, uh, this um, maybe look complicated if you if you look at it immediately. But essentially, what what is included here is that take the number of primes congruent to a mod q, and it should be pi of x divided by phi of q. So this one is a remainder term. Uh, do the sum upon all the classes and multiply by something, you get that it's less than pi of x by 2. Um, this is valid for q around a set of pairwise co-prime integer. That's only a retelling of um, the uh, barbon davenport halberstam inequalities. Um, sometimes people, I mean, one believes that the large sieve inequality has to do with uh, with sums of characters or with uh, exponential sum. In fact, uh, arithmetically speaking, you have complete sums, which means that you have a complete sum upon A. Okay, A is co-prime is Q, but essentially it's, uh, you can look at, think about it like uh, A modulo Q. So it's a complete sum, which means that you count points and you can convert a uh, result from uh, from uh, relative inequality to counting points. And that's, that's what this, this result is, uh, that's, that's how you make this result. And um, once, well, once you do that and you do some, uh, some uh, uh, optimization process, what you get is that if you get, give yourself a co-prime uh, moduli, QI, and I'm assuming that you are less than X to the one quarter for simplicity because I want, I want to, to that thing that you, you may understand. When you get this inequality, phi of q upon cardinality of a of q, well, I mean, the number of classes that are covered by the primes, minus one is less than two. So for instance, if you take three moduli, q1, q, q2, q3, q3, one of, for one of them, this quantity is less than two thirds. So it means that for one of them, a of q is larger than three fifths phi of q. And you've beaten the factor two with that. Okay, you don't know exactly which QI you have, but still you can beat the factor two. That's, uh, that's completely similar to, uh, to the um, exceptional modulus uh, uh, behavior. And what can you do with that? Oh, first, yes. <laughs> Before doing something, I have to give you a crash course on uh, Linux problem. Um, because maybe you can find a prime in an arithmetic progression that is small. I mean, instead of, of trying to go through this uh, Brundtich smart stuff and uh, large inequality and modulus that you don't control, maybe you can have a look at the simple problem, find a prime congruent to A mod Q, and maybe you can show uh, that you can find a prime as than Q to the one plus epsilon. Uh, Linux in 44 and, um, and has been improved. I mean, Linux in 34 proved that there is a constant L, uh, absolute constant, so that uh, every class is modulo Q, every invertible class is modulo Q, can be uh, covered by a prime less than Q to the L. Uh, the fact that it should be not exponential Q, but uh, Q to some power, was a, was a major progress. Um, his Brown in 92 uh, uh, lowered the, the effective value of, of Q uh, dramatically and reduced it to 5.5. Since then, I don't know of, uh, of many new ideas that have been introduced on this problem. Uh, Xiloris in 2011 pushed the computation of uh, his Brown and published 5.18, you see. And in his uh, PhD memoir, you see five. But let's say that we can, we can, we know that Linux constant can be taken between, let's say five and 5.18. And um, no one has been able to give a, a decent value for Q node. 
It is explicit. Uh, you can give a value for Q node, but it's very large for Q node. I don't even know of any, any given value. It's extremely large. If we assume a generalized Riemann hypothesis, so the Riemann hypothesis for all the L functions, uh, we can reduce 5.5 to 2 plus epsilon. And it should be possible to get it explicit. And I think it has been done by Barr and Sorensen 20 years back, but I'm sorry, I, but I forgot. But uh, uh, under GRH, it's possible to get it explicit. Uh, yeah, yes. And most probably, we believe that the good value should be one to the psi. So, um, anyway. There are some heuristical arguments that tell you that. So there, there's two issues. Um, diminish the 5.5 .5 or the 5 of Zilloris or 5.80 and uh, get an explicit version of it. So um, um, that is valid for, for decent integers Q. OK. Um, so um, uh, let me go back. So here we know that out of three, uh, for th if we have three moduli, one of them has A of Q larger than three fifths pi of Q. What can you do with that? Well, that's what I. I well, if you get give yourself three moduli uh, co-prime, less than x to the one quarter, then for one of them, you can cover all the classes by a product of two primes. Um, it's simply because the, the primes are, are very large. And uh, then if you double the size multiplicity, double the size of the set, you cover every, everything. There's, there's no difficulty in it. But now in, um, there was um, the problem. Uh, we wanted to show that every integer larger than 454 is a sum of seven non-negative cubes. Uh, Linux in 43 uh, proves that every large enough integer is a sum of uh, this many cubes. Uh, the proof had been simplified by Watson in 51, greatly simplified by Watson in 55. And then it has been further simplified by uh, McCurley in 84. I, he made it explicit, essentially, by playing by with one modulus or two modulus, uh, one modulus or two modulus. Um, the numerical difficulty of this proof is that uh, it's re you need to, to produce a prime in an arithmetic progression to a very large uh, modulus. For Linux, it was uh, log x to the 9. Uh, for Watson, it was log x to the 12, if I remember well. The same for McCurley, it was about log x to the 12. And the, 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 prime, the, the explicit version of the prime number in arithmetic progression that we have are, are, are very bad. So what we are able to prove is that every integer larger than 10 to the many, half a million, is the sum of seven non-negative cubes. And uh, uh, by removing the primes in arithmetic progression, but putting a, a product of two primes uh, and using uh, an identity of Enrico Bombieri, uh, um, I reduce this enormous bound to 10 to the 230. So you see, we, we, we can use this kind of, uh, of result of very, uh, with lots of efficiency. And recently, uh, Samir Siksek wrote a beautiful paper in which he finally proves that every integer larger than what we believe is the smallest, I mean, no, larger than 454, is a sum, is indeed a sum of seven non-negative cubes. Okay, so that was one, one, one news age. Um, well, what I like about this method is also its flexibility. You know, I started by saying, uh, have a look at the method of uh, Subramanian and uh, Ahmad Sandra and so flexible. And uh, in, in Q aspect, it's flexible also. So for instance, if you, if you look at the primes, so that P plus one is the sum of two squares, and said two co-prime squares for simplicity, because it's, it seems better. Um, Ivanyet in his PhD proved that uh, you have the good number of such primes. So you have X upon log X to the three half. It's a C of dimension three half for people who understand what I'm saying. Um, um, but I don't know how explicit, how 
I don't know whether we, we know we have an idea of this constant here. And you can use this, the very same method. You can build a, a same sim, a similar setting around the uh, Barbon Davenport Halberstam inequality, but not with characters because you don't have any characters anymore in this setting, but you, you can build the same thing. And what you get is that uh, um, if you give yourself, uh, if there is an H, so that if you give yourself H uh, co-prime moduli, uh, less than x to the one third, uh, then every class modulo q, um, I mean modulo one of them, every class modulo q can be covered with a product of four of them. Um, I would like to get h, but to get h means that I would like to get a constant in this lower bound here. Uh, even asymptotic, what, what, what do we get? And then the, the proof would unfold and uh, we would be able to, to get this, uh, this uh, explicitly. It's, an, it's a kind of a multiplicative Schneerlman problem with a, with a complicated sequence. So, uh, for, so, so we don't know uh, the number of primes and though this sequence is very complicated, we can prove this kind of, uh, of result. Okay, but in some problems, you don't want any exceptions in Q. Uh, in some problems, you don't want uh, you don't want to know that it's out of Q1, Q2, or Q3. You want to know exactly that uh, you can cover the, the integers with um, with some primes, so the classes modulo Q with some primes. So I was giving some talk about what I done on sums of seven cubes and um, what were the limitations of product of two primes. And Alan Walker was uh, very young at the time, and he was in the in the room, and he said, "Well, you know, I can uh, I can do something so that uh, we can we can push a problem not for two primes. We don't want p1, p2 to be uh, to cover everyone, but p1, p2, p3." And then we we started uh, working with Alan, then with Oriol Serra and Priyambad, and now I'm trying to get my value number down to one because just now my value number is two. So I would like to write a paper with Valas uh, again, and it's in progress. The paper is written. It has to be published for the uh, value number to be officially equal to one. Uh, but uh, I hope that by the end of the, this year, I'll be able I'll be able to say that uh, I'm a, I'm a one value person. Okay. So <laughs> what we have in uh, in uh, our bags just now is this theorem. Uh, take a, a modulus q larger than 10 to the 30 when well, we are working hard on the numeric but it's, it's the proof is difficult uh, we can find three primes p1 p2 p3 less than q to the five half so that p1 p2 p3 is congruent to any class you want I mean, give yourself a class you can find p1 p2 p3 so that p1 p2 p3 congruent to this class would work um, what we had with Aled was something larger than five as an exponent. Uh, what we had with Priyambad and Oriol was uh, three. Uh, so this one is published. And what we're able to get now is uh, less than three, five half. Uh, the, the earlier method was, was blocked at three, so we are, we are rather happy with this one. Um, so you see, now we have no exceptions in Q, but we've lost one prime. We have three of them. Uh, but still, we have exactly three of them. It's P1, P2, P3, not uh, a, a P3 primes, not a, an integer that has at most three prime factors. We have exactly three prime factors. And we, we, we are rather happy uh, about that. Um, it's still uh, explicit. We have some difficulties, but it's still explicit. And of course, we wanted to go beyond uh, the exponent two, because on Riemann hypothesis, we, I mean, in general Riemann hypothesis, we have two for primes. And that we've been able to, to get, in fact, by the same method. Um, it's, the proof is much simpler, in fact. Um, so uh, we, we can prove that uh, uh, given Q uh, and given epsilon and uh, given a Class A A prime to Q, we can find three primes P1, P2, P3 less than Q to the three half to the epsilon, so that P1, P2, P3 is congruent to A mod Q. 
And uh, we were very happy because the three half is less than two. Okay. okay, after that, we have difficulties that I don't want to. I've given several talks on this problem, so I don't want to, to enter this part. Um, it, there's a recent paper by Petrov and Young, uh, I mean, a preprint, but I, I guess that it will become a paper soon. Uh, if Q is cube free, uh, we can reduce, I mean, we can use their result and reduce uh, three half to four third, uh, which is getting closer and closer to one. And I mean, we have some other condition. I mean, if, if you assume that all the prime factors that divide Q are going to three mod four, uh, we can get 11 by eight. You see, it's, uh, we, 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 we are getting close, but uh, additional difficulties are, are, are showing uh, uh, their nose. So let me go slowly, no, no, not slowly, but fast around some elements of proof and to go. So we need some additive combinatoric and that's all be given by Ignatius theorem. Uh, but it's not in, in, in my talk now. Um, what we'll need is a brilliant idea of Priam Vad, um, a student of, of Bal. Uh, to get uh, to prove a Brundtich Marsh inequality for cosets. Um, I like this inequality uh, quite a lot, so let us state it. Um, give yourself a subgroup of index Y of uh, Z by Q Z star. Yes, I should have put the multiplicative subgroup here. So H is a multiplicative subgroup. And assume the index is very small. I mean, index four, five, six, uh, it can go till a rather large value, but in fact, assume that the index is very small. So you have a very large subgroup. Yes. And look at the number of primes in, uh, in, this, in the coset of this subgroup. Huh? Then you can improve on the large sieve, uh, on the Brundtich Marsh inequality, not on the factor two, because that you cannot. But instead of having x by q, you can have x by square root of q. You lose y, but y is going to be a constant. What is uh, rather amazing also with this, with this uh, result is that it is valid even if x is less than q. Uh, x can go till the square root of q, in fact. And that's, uh, that's what we've used in the, in, the, in the result. So it's one version of, I said, uh, variations about around the Brundtich Marsh inequality. Uh, one variation is this one, uh, valid for, for very low values of, uh, of x with respect to q. Um, and um, okay, uh, this one forget, excuse me. No, not, not forget. The, the, the theorem we, we have with, uh, with Balu and Priyan we will have to, to take care of, of three problems. So um, the, the first one is what I'm going to talk about. We have to get a large density, which is given by some Brundtich smart inequalities. Uh, and then we have to go from the density to the individual representation. So it's Knesset theorem and anything additional you can, you can find. And we've added some P2 numbers. And then because of Knesset theorem, we have difficulties of accumulation of primes in, uh, in subgroup. Um, and that we have to, to, to handle. So uh, that was what uh, Aled Walker brought at the beginning in, uh, in what I was doing. He said that if you use some lower bound for L1K, you can uh, avoid the accumulation in a quadratic subgroup. And then we added some other stuff to, to avoid accumulation in, in more subgroup. So let me uh, conclude this, uh, this talk with a vertical uh, Brundtich Marsh inequality. Something that. Um, so, well, 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 what do we need uh, in, this, in this problem? that we don't need exactly to, to know that for one class, the primes uh, um, uh, do not accumulate in this class, but we want to show that the number of classes where the primes accumulate are small. Uh, the, the, that's what we want. And what we prove, in fact, uh, it has been already proved by, uh, by Houlet in 72. But what we've introduced in the proof, let's say, uh, we are able to get x upon square root of q instead of x by q um, for almost all uh, a, 
That's what this inequality tells you here. It's almost all. Uh, and for x as small as uh, q to the three half, uh, what we have is that the, the proof is is um, simpler than the earlier ones. Uh, so we can make it completely explicit and with rather decent constant. Uh, also, the the phrase um, I prefer this phrasing here because you see immediately where you can uh, you can. Uh, what are the constants you have to compute, really? Uh, when you say for, for almost all classes modulo Q, it's, it's, it's a bit vague. Um, so that's what, uh, what uh, finally calls the vertical brundage marsh inequality, that was uh, with analogy of um, um, satellite distribution. Um, so the horizontal counterpart has been studied quite a lot. I mean, you take, you fix A and you vary Q, uh, here we have Q fixed and we, we vary A. We have less, uh, less material at our disposal because we have only, uh, only the, the multiplicative properties modulo Q and, uh, and we know it uh, not so well. I'm just going to show you uh, very fast uh, how one proves this one and then that will be the end. Uh, um, essentially because I... I'm, I'm going to, to have a look at the smooth version. So you put eta, which is a smoothing function. So things are going to, to go a uh, better way. You take um, a sieve weight here, which is almost Selberg's uh, sieve here, um, which is uniform with respect to the class, like an enveloping sieve. Just develop everything, blah, blah, blah. And um, Lambda D1, D2, D1 and D2 are supposed to be small. That's the idea of the sieve. D1, D2 is small. So you put them in front and you see what you have inside. And what you have inside, well, you have the, the trivial character. Um, um, yeah, for the inequality, I, I, we have a trick with Robert Romley uh, from long ago, which makes that you can reduce to primitive characters that's going to simplify your life. Anyway, for, for k equal, so k note, for equal one, in fact, uh, you have the main contribution, which is this one. And for chi uh, not equal to chi naught, uh, you convert it into, uh, you express it in terms of um, Boolean transform. Okay. Uh, that's a big expression you have here. And now you have to handle this integral, where k uh, is the one with, uh, with the Selder coefficient here. And um, of course, here you, you you have to wonder what you're going to do. I mean, whether you want to exploit the bilinear structure of K, I mean, almost bilinear structure of K, whether you want to exploit the force power moment. And, uh, and in fact, uh, what we do is, is extremely simple. Uh, we take the L infinite norm. I mean, we push the line of integration, of course. But we, we take the L infinite norms out for LSK and we use a uh, hybrid large sieve inequality for this polynomial, which is already square. Um, so it's, of course, you need some, some explicit version of, uh, of all of that. And you need some simplification of cell bag weights and uh, let's say more theoretical viewpoint. It's at this level here where we simply take the infinite uh, norm out and we have a uh, hybrid large inequality, which is, which is simple enough. Um, I'm going to end the talk here because I went through enough material and it's time. Thank you. Over. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Amari, for this beautiful talk and very interesting results. Uh, so let me open the room for questions. If you have any questions, please unmute yourself and ask. Oh, hello. Uh, I just have a quick comment about the uh, Hensley Richards result oh, that you mentioned uh, earlier. Yes. Uh, the, the secondary term has been improved recently by Konyagin uh, by a log log factor. I, I, I haven't seen the, uh, the actual paper, but he spoke about it in, in one of these online seminars. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it, was a, it was the number theory web seminar sometime last fall. So yeah, I think those are available online. Yeah. Uh, thank you.
I have a question about something you said at the very beginning. If you could maybe scroll back. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I think this is just a terminological question, maybe. Um, yeah. Where? Uh, I'll tell you when to, okay. Uh, well, yeah, there. So uh, you said that this theorem, um, you get nothing by analytic means, even on our age. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you just look at the sum of uh, P to the I gamma and write it as a prong integral and move the line of integration into um, certainly on RH to the one half line or into a, a classical zero free region for zeta, um, don't you get something like this? Uh, I don't think so. Um, we, 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 with a classical zero free region? Yeah. Uh, 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 If you tell me that I should look at it, I'm, uh, it's a long time I haven't looked at that. Uh, I don't think so. But So, um, I mean, you said that uh, a way of approaching it would be to split the primes into intervals of length, something like square root P, mm -hmm, if um, yes. gamma squared is P, let's say, and try to understand the number of primes there. And that certainly you couldn't do, even assuming our age, if you fixed the interval of length, mm -hmm. square root P. But, but are you, the, you the, using the... the, the the collection of intervals from the very beginning. Yes, you yes mean? Uh, exactly. So you, you don't just have a single interval here. You have a lot of intervals covering it. Yes. Um, uh, I, I have to... I, I, I cannot do it uh, online. I have to think about it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, I, I think this does follow from, um, certainly from our region, I think from the classical zero free region. But, but not if you try to split it up into little intervals, it won't work. Yes. If you just keep the sum complete from the start. Uh, I, I have to have a look at it, sorry. Okay. Yeah, any, any other comments or questions? Okay, if not, let's uh, thank the speaker again.